Well, good morning again, church. Welcome. If you're new, welcome, welcome. Good morning to everyone online as well. My name is Joshua, and uh, we are ready. Good morning, guys. Let's, uh, let's pray over our time as we head into, uh, and there will be, for the teachers to know as well, this will be uh, probably a shortened time. We'll end at about 45 is the hope. We'll see how I do. No, that's, <laughs> we will end at about 45 today, so uh, be prepared. Let's pray over our children and our time in the Word together this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy scriptures. Thank you for the teachers. Thank you for our little ones. Thank you for this time. Lord, we have set this time apart as your people to hear your scriptures, your truth, to be shaped by them upstairs and down. Lord, bless those who teach. Keep us straight in the ministry of the word. And bless all of us, Lord, that our hearts are open to receive from you. Shape us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Kids, you can head downstairs. Everyone else, you can open your Bibles or your Fibles, however you have it, to Romans chapter 1 as we continue on. And we have been moving in the first pillar. If you remember, in the book of Romans, Paul sets up four pillars for us to have a much richer, grander understanding of the gospel. More than just a quick answer for the gospel, but a grand understanding that impacts all of our lives, all of our relationships, and in fact, the history of the world. So before I head into this, what are the ABCs of the gospel? Does anybody remember this? Just a few weeks ago. ABCs. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen, church. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You're going to hear him again this morning and every morning. Amen? Every Sunday morning. Every morning. Hopefully you are. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the title of today is This Is Your Wake Up Call. I do quite a bit of traveling, less right now, especially while Beth is finishing her master's, but I do quite a bit of traveling. And sometimes when I travel, there isn't a place to, to charge my stuff, or maybe it's dead. And so I rely on a wake up call from room service. Who here knows about a wake up call from room service? Who here enjoys a wake-up call from room service? There, there we go. There we go. One person. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> At home, I have my alarm clock set the way I want it. I have one that even increases the volume as it goes. When I'm away, it's another voice. It's a voice outside giving me a wake-up call. And I have a choice whether to respond or not. I can hit the snooze button. I can turn it off, I, 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 right? I, I, can, I can just hang up the phone and be done with it. I can go back to sleep. If I go back to sleep, I lose out on the life that's planned for me. This is a wake-up call. As Paul is writing to the church, don't forget this, to the church he is writing these passages. We're starting in 118. I don't like wake-up calls, but they're good for me. Amen? We don't want to just ignore them. We don't want to miss out on life. We just read in 117, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation. Amen? To everyone who believes. And it ends with the righteous live by faith. Sometimes we get caught up because our Bibles put these big separations between one verse and another. And they're there for our benefit. They're there to help us find things and locate things and remember things. But I want you to follow the train of thought here. Paul says, the righteous shall live by faith. And then he says, for God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godliness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. This is the next thought. The next thought here. The righteous live by faith. So then we ask the question, how do the unrighteous live? Paul is answering that question for us. He's flowing in the Holy Spirit to provide this understanding. If the righteous live by faith, how do the unrighteous live? Because if we are living unrighteously, church, we want to know. Amen? We want the wake-up call. 
And there's two key concepts that he introduces right away. The wrath of God and unrighteousness. Those are complex, really difficult concepts. And one of the reasons that they're difficult is because of our distance in time. 2,000 years later from when this was written. A culture, multiple cultures away from when this was written. Verse 17, now match this, verse 17 talks about righteousness And verse 18 talks about unrighteousness. And that's how the Hebrew people understood it. That's how Paul understood it. They're mirror images of each other. So then wrath and salvation are mirror images of each other. Do you see this? They're mirror images of each other. We get confused because we solely define wrath by anger. The Gentiles did that. Paul was preaching to a church that was mostly made up, in preaching and writing the epistle, mostly made up of Gentiles. The Greeks had many gods, and the gods fought together constantly, and they were vengeful, and they were malicious, and they were deceitful, and they were constantly trying to get their own way. So the wrath of the gods for the Gentiles had a very different understanding than the wrath of God for the Hebrews, for the Jewish people. So he introduces this. What is wrath? Just quick, do a free association in your head. What is wrath? Most likely, I mean, I just did a little bit of an introduction, but the first word is anger. Do you know that Paul refers to the wrath of God throughout the New Testament, and he never talks about the anger of God in that way, that him being angry and therefore wrath? The wrath is poured out By God, and he says here, he says, wrath reveals. The wrath is revealed. Wrath reveals the severity of sin. And salvation offers the only escape. Without the reality of wrath, salvation loses its meaning. Wrath is the suffering of being separated from God. And we have the whole passage here. Salvation and wrath, mirror images of God's justice. God's justice. God is faithful to his covenant, and so he provides salvation. God is faithful to his character and goodness, and so therefore he provides wrath to all who need to be condemned for evil. They are mirror images of each other. God's wrath is revealed in him, delivering us over. See, The Jewish people had an understanding of wrath within history. There is this old age, a new age, and there's this thing called the day of the Lord, that God's wrath will be poured out on the day of the Lord. Now we know that the first day of the Lord is Jesus, that the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus on the cross. Hallelujah. Amen? That he took the curse. He took the full wrath of God once for all. Amen? Once for all. But they also understood the wrath of God was being poured out within history. That when God's people rebelled against him, it started all the way in Genesis. The consequence of that was they were exiled from the Garden of Eden. And everything that followed is God's wrath being poured out. Death, sickness, torment, the hard work with thorns, all of those. And then you see it more within history. You see the, the, the people in, in Israel rebelling against God and exiled to another country. You see the wrath of God. They understood the wrath of God as being both within history and on the day of the Lord. And that's what we're seeing here as well. So unrighteousness versus righteousness. Well, the righteous live by faith, so how do the unrighteous live? Do you see it in your passage? How do the unrighteous live? By suppressing the truth. The righteous live by faith. The unrighteous suppress the truth. That's how they live. 
So we have to have an understanding. We have to be open to the Scriptures and to the Holy Spirit setting alarm clocks in us to make sure that we are not suppressing the truth and not living unrighteously. Sometimes, again, that word unrighteous, we think of just bad works. It's about relationship. Righteousness is a right relationship with God. Unrighteousness is a wrong relationship with God. Do you catch that? We need to understand these two concepts, wrath of God and unrighteousness, or everything that follows, we're not going to catch. The righteous live one way, the unrighteous another. Now, that word suppress, I hope it caught you. And your translation might say something different. A lot say hold, which is probably the best literal translation, but it's a difficult one. Hold, to the, hold against the truth. So that word hold in the Greek, suppress, it can go two ways. You can hold on to something or you can hold against something. This one, by context, is suppress. They hold against it. Think about it this way. Let me paint an image for you. You're in a canoe and you're going down a river. And when you're in a canoe, you feel the water. Do you know what I mean? I don't know how many of you are canoers <laughs> or a kayak. You're in there and you can feel the water underneath you. And there's a current underneath all of us. There's this current underneath and you can feel it. And the current says, go this way. That's truth. That's God. This current underneath all of us. In some ways you can understand it as general revelation. It's open to everybody. There's a current underneath all of us. But we say, I don't want to go that way. I don't want to be led by a current. I'm in control. I want to go that way. So what does the kayaker do? They take the oar and they put it in the water against the current and then pull. That's suppressing the truth. God's truth is available to everyone, to anyone, and you're going to see him talk about this. Suppressing is putting the oar in the water and pulling against truth. What we know, eternity, God put eternity into our hearts. The oar in the river. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. Every single human being throughout history has access to the truth. Every single human being has access to it. And we pull against it in selfishness because we want control. We want to define good and evil. We say, I am in charge of my life and nobody else. That's suppressing the truth, pulling against the current. It's a package deal. Everyone sees this. Even a historian named J.A. Froud says this, one lesson and one lesson only history may be said to repeat with distinctiveness, that the world is somehow built on moral foundations, that in the long run, it is well with the good, and in the long run, it will be ill with the wicked. God made this world, this is me talking, not Jay. The, the God made this world with such an order that his wrath is even revealed to historians with eyes to see. God provides it's who he is. He's the instigator, the initiator. God provides God's truth, God's love, God's salvation. You cannot pick and choose. It is a package deal for who he is. Everyone needs him. Truth, that God alone is the source of knowing good and evil. Love, that God alone defines love, not by desire, but according to his design. To see others flourish through commitment and sacrifice. Salvation from separation to oneness is only possible through Jesus Christ. Everyone then needs to be delivered. It says, for though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were hardened. See, it's a matter of worship. 
to not give glory to the one who deserves it, to not be thankful to the one who deserves it. He is the provider. It's a matter of worship. To refuse to glorify God and show him gratitude is to deny him the worship he deserves. God will not permit us then to just go on our own. He makes it clear. He puts his revelation out there for everyone to take hold of. And he's calling it out in this passage. We're going to get to more and more things that are going to set off your alarm clocks, church. I hope they are. But we have to be aware when we're unrighteous. One of our children, one of my kids, was born covered in feces. He, I said he, so you know, you know who it is. <laughs> covered in poop. But without hesitation... Beth asked me to bring the baby close to her. She kissed him on the head. Now, I have a picture of Beth kissing Toby with poop on his head. <laughs> Beth loved him dearly. Did she keep him covered in poop? No. As soon as she kissed him, she said, please give him a bath. Church, sometimes we miss nice is not as good as love. Love holds people accountable to the truth, and I think we have confused niceness with gentleness. We are supposed to speak the truth gently, humbly, in submission to the Holy Spirit, loving someone in that way. In fact, Next Sunday, we'll be talking about it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And in the power of God is good news. Sometimes we think that our loudness or our ability to command others is the power of God. Nope. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served what has been created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. I love that last little piece there. <laughs> to me, it tells me that in Paul's spirit here, he's not doing this yelling at people. Do you hear that? In the midst of this talking about sexual immorality, he says... The creator is what we want. The creator. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you imagine him sitting there? I think it was Tertius that wrote this letter down for him. And he's sitting there with Tertius. And he's saying stuff in the Holy Spirit. And Tertius is writing stuff down. And in the middle of this point, he bursts into worship. Do you see? I love that. I love that. Right in the middle of the Paul Creator who is praised forever. Amen. Amen. I love the line from Hallelujah this morning. Can we all say Hallelujah right here in the midst of this? Hallelujah. Amen. It's all about worship, but now they've moved from suppressing the truth to substituting. See, this is the next. God delivered them over into substituting instead of just suppressing the truth. Now they've substituted, and substituting is a bad deal. We substitute in our own understanding rather than in God's revelation. I like to garden. I have a garden bed. I'm not the best gardener. My neighbor, who is an interior designer, can tell you that any day of the week, okay? I'm not the best gardener. But I obey the laws that are already set in place when I garden. And usually, if she gives me tips, she says, you haven't watered enough, enough Josh, or you haven't done that right. I don't do, oh, this is a garden bed. I know how to make a bed. I'm going to take some blankets, take them out here, take a pillow, put that down, put the seeds on a pillow, 
and then get bamboo sheets because they're really expensive. Put those on top. What would that do to the seeds? Kill them. In our own understanding, everything leads to death. In God's understanding, everything leads to life. We do not want to substitute. For this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. Their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men, in the same way, also left natural relations with women and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. We are seeing the wrath of God in history. It's a package deal. It's all false worship. Idolatry, sexual immorality, and division, the three big ones we've already touched on, idolatry and sexual immorality, and you're going to see division next. Why would he save division last? Isn't sexual immorality the biggest one? No, of course, idolatry is the first and greatest commandment. Amen? But now, don't we think, no, 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 it's sexual immorality. That's the biggest one. Well, let's make it really simple, church, and see if any alarm clocks go off. God endorses sex. He loves sex. It's made for fruitfulness, for passion, for joy, within the confines of a man and woman being joined together in holy matrimony. Now, let's go the next step. Anything outside of that is sexual immorality. Everything apart from him leads to death. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind so that they do what is not right. We need to pray for deliverance. If your alarm clock has been going off this morning, if you're fighting, I'm just reading. If you're fighting what is written down in the word of God, we need to adjust this. If that alarm clock is going off, and we can. Listen closely, but don't argue with God. Test everything. Hold on to what is true. The alarm clock of the Holy Spirit. Are you ready, church? Are you ready for the next piece? This is the next piece. This is the piece that Paul, this incredible man, is building toward in the Holy Spirit. They are filled with unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And we forget it with our brothers and sisters. We bring death on our relationships when we slander outside, when we gossip about one another. Look at what he's pointing out here. Confess your sins, and God is faithful and just to forgive. He's faithful and just to forgive. Toby is an incredible man of God. He is really growing up an incredible man. And I say that because I'm about to talk about his laundry. <laughs> his laundry gets bad. And he's not the only one. Come on, church. Come on. Now, as his parents, we can choose to deliver him over into a room full of filth. And he'll live out the consequences. No clean clothes. Stench. And then an impact on personal, personal hygiene. But we can also provide salvation. Let me tell you, sometimes God is just far better than us ever, we could ever be, all right? We want him to do his laundry, okay? So this is different. But for salvation, God provided he saw where we were. He saw the dirty laundry. He knows everything that's setting off the alarm clocks of your heart right now. And he sent his one and only son to die on that cross to receive the full wrath of God. Nothing, no sin is greater than the work of Christ on the cross. He is there once for all. Nothing else but to trust in the work of Jesus Christ. Deliverance has been accomplished. We just need to receive it. Although they knew God's just sentence, 
Those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but they applaud others who practice them. This is the last piece, from suppression to substitution and now celebration. There are three ways that we can respond to this wake-up call today. Number one, we can suppress the truth and go our own way. Number two, we can receive the truth. Wake up and go with God. God loves you. God loves you. In the midst of whatever you're feeling right now, know this, God loves you. A reminder popped up on Beth's phone this morning that on November 10th, not too long ago, when my kids were like four, Cora said, Toby, you know I love you, don't you? And there was a big pause. And then Toby said, yes, I absolutely know you do. This is your wake-up call. Repent and live in freedom. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Can you stand? If anything, set off your alarm clocks. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I'm going to leave a space for you to confess before the Lord. Repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that you want me to know the truth. Believe the truth. Speak the truth. And live in accordance with the truth. Thank you for providing your truth. Your love. And your salvation through Jesus Christ. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by virtue of his shed blood and resurrection, asking you to free me from any and all deception in my life, in my mind, in my heart, in my spirit, outside myself, and any unclean spirits. Therefore, since you accept me just as I am in Christ, I can be free to face my sin and not try to hide. I ask for the Holy Spirit to guide me right now. I ask you, search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my worried thoughts. See if there be any hurtful way in me. Take a moment and confess your sin before God. Father, repeat after me. Father, I want to live by faith in Jesus and not worship anything else. Lead me in the everlasting way. I have trusted in Jesus alone to save me, and so I am your forgiven child. I now ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and lead me into all truth. I pray for your complete protection in the name of Jesus who is the truth. I pray, amen, amen. Church, we are gonna head right into a baptism. Baptism is the great separator. It's an ordinance of separation between our old life and life in Christ. It is a moment in time where we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and we are identified with him in his burial and in his resurrection. Amen? If you have not been baptized, and if you have a conviction today, you are welcome. Come forward. We'll talk with you to get baptized. But 
baptism is such a good thing for us. I'm going to ask parents to go get any kids that are downstairs to come them up. You are welcome. Everyone is welcome to stay and bear witness to these baptisms. Otherwise, if you have to go, I understand that. You are free to leave. You may need to leave. understand. I understand. I understand, okay? God bless you all. May you go in freedom. Amen. <laughs>